Welcome back to Wild Treasures. As we continue exploring the porcupine and the challenges this mammal faces on a daily basis. In 2007, a report was compiled by Nick Chavalier and Belinda Ashton on the growing porcupine quill industry. The demand for the quill was a cause for concern as the price was increasing. Porcupine quills are used to create artwork, pens and jewellery ranging from bracelets, necklaces and earrings. Prices used to be around 6 rand per quill 9 years ago, but now the price has increased close to 90 rand a quill. Contrary to popular belief, a porcupine doesn't shoot out their quills. In fact, they don't shed their quills, not even when mating, but only when a predator comes in contact with the quills which is then easily detached from the body. Porcupine keeper from the Joburg Zoo shed more light on these rodents. Uh, I think the main thing uh, is that the porcupines are the largest rodent in Africa. And then um, and the porcupines, they live in group and then they live in the burrows as well. That's where they uh, reproduce their, 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 their babies uh, under those burrows. And then another thing which is very interesting is that they've got pills throughout their body which they use them as a defense mechanism against any enemy. So if wherever they are, uh, think that they are in danger and then they can see the enemy, they reverse into that particular person if it's a person. Despite people not knowing much of these animals, they are actually very interesting. For instance, the female's breasts are not on the belly like most mammals, but actually on their front limbs. And then another thing that they do that when the baby is born, the entire group members go and lick the baby in order to welcome the baby in the group to make sure that the baby uh, is not an enemy. It's just a new arrival in the form of a baby, which is very, very interesting. And another thing which they do as well, um, which I find it uh, very interesting, and then they are able to, uh, to run very fast. I never thought a porcupine could run, but they are able to run very fast. DV doesn't believe so much in their lucky charm, but does remember spotting their quills on the king's hat in his native hometown. Um, in, in my culture, uh, I believe that they, they are hunted for their quills uh, because you'll see your chief on his head will have porcupine quills on his head. And then those quills, they are not, it's not the quills that they have uh, collected from the ground. Obviously, the, the porcupine was killed somewhere. Mating season for these animals mostly happen between August and May, as they prefer the rainy season. Females can give birth only once a year, unless the previous litter was lost, with up to three young ones being born. The Joburg Zoo itself has had recent success with a little one born this month. And then another thing which is interesting about them is that it's, not, it's mainly uh, the male and the female dominant uh, porcupines who are allowed to mate. Even though in other cases it depends that uh, there might be snake matings where you find that your other subordinate porcupines will be able to give birth, but it's mainly restricted to the two to give birth until uh, either one of them is replaced by the other one. This is the main, the reason for this is because it's mainly because um, if we were to have each and every female mating uh, in, the, in the group porcupine, uh, you'll find that the father will end up 
mating with, uh, with a daughter. So it's to avoid inbreeding, which is a natural way actually, which is very, very uh, important. Although Africa's largest rodent is not endangered, they are still secretive and nocturnal animals, making it difficult for anyone to know how many there are left in the wild. Porcupines are listed as least concerned on the Icon Red List, but that does not mean they are safe. Many nature conservation organizations including the SPCA, have found many man-made mashes used to catch porcupines in high densely bush areas. Hunting and capturing these animals is illegal and anyone caught with a porcupine or setting up traps can be arrested. I think the best way to, to protect the species, uh, the first thing um, is, to, is to regulate but first you need to be able to establish how many porcupines do you have in the wild to be able to put them in the category whether they're endangered or threatened in a way but there might be some kind of protection around the porcupine and then how many porcupines are we losing in a year if we're doing census of porcupine in South Africa how many are we losing, how many do we have, are we losing or not Even though there are laws and organizations working hand in hand with authorities to protect the species. More work still lies ahead, especially in creating awareness on the legal rights these animals have. Be mindful of them, be aware of the fact that if you have a cat or a dog at home, cows and porcupines and giraffes and rhino all feel the same emotions. They might not express it in the same way, which we understand. But very often humans don't express their emotions in the same way. Where one person is excitable and talks with their hands and, and all the rest of it, somebody else would be calm and stoic and so on. So we can't assign human emotions to animals, but we can assign the fact that they feel emotions. Anybody who's driven down a farm road and seen lambs frisking in the fields knows that they're expressing happiness. It, it doesn't take a genius to understand this. We need to be mindful of the fact that our decisions have impacts, lasting impacts on others around us and human rights and animal rights go hand in hand. To give you an example, there is, we know, it's been proven over and over again, that serial killers start out abusing animals when they're young. But the same holds true in domestic violence. Very often, if there is a family animal, the family animal is the person who suffers first before the abuser moves on to either the children or the partner. So there's a definite, definite link there. So when we're fighting for, for animal rights, we're actually fighting for human rights at grassroots level. We're starting at the beginning because this is where it starts. When you are attacking and abusing um, animals who have no voice and who are at our mercy, we are attacking the most vulnerable in our society. And they are not the environment. They are not out there. We are the environment. We are part and parcel of the natural world. We tend to forget that. We are human animals. We are primates. I do not believe in killing animals for lucky charms. You understand? I do not believe that. You understand? Because there's a lot of herbs that can do that. People are just lazy to go out and dig for good herbs for lucky. You understand? So the simplest way is, is those animals. During the olden days, um, animals were protected in a different way. Because it was believed that if you, if I kill, to give, any, we have an, to give you an example, if I kill a porcupine, something bad will happen to me or even my entire family. And then that was well respected across uh, the tribes during that time. So that, that was a way uh, of protecting them. So, People were taking part in conservation during that way, even though it, it is not, not recognized now, but that's how it was.
It is only through a combined effort that this species can be protected, with a greater responsibility lying with the public and the way they view these animals. My name is Stefani Janssen van Fern and it has been my pleasure bringing you this season of Wild Treasures right here on ANN7. Till next time, cheers, tot ziens, salan gantle.